I really appreciate the invitation to be with you this evening to talk about the history of Abyssinian in Greenwich Village. Um, and the book is called Witness. And let me just look here. And I'm one of four authors on it. This was a bicentennial history book that came out in 2014 uh, commemorating the bicentennial of Abyssinia, which was in 2008. The lead author was Jenna Ray McNeil, who is uh, actually just recently retired from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And then Houston Roberson and Quentin Hosford Dixie, who is uh, Houston Roberson passed away about a year ago. He was at um, Sewanee University and Quentin Dixie is at Purdue, Indiana. And Quentin did most of the work on what I'll be talking about this evening. And I assisted with some of that. And then the other parts of the book that I did was a lot of, I was, um, I'm still a member of Abyssinia. I joined Abyssinia in 1987. And in the early 90s, uh, Dr. Calvin Butts, who was pastor, uh, asked a group of volunteers to assemble archives of the church. And so I was part of that group. And that group eventually became the Archives and History Ministry. And I led that group for um, for many years. And I believe I know some of our members are um, here this evening. And so a lot of that work tied in with finding images um, from our archives. Um, I supported the other authors on this. And so what I'm going to talk about tonight, though, is Abyssinian's history before Greenwich Village, because that is less well known. Abyssinian was founded in 1808, and it uh, grew out of First Baptist Church, which was literally the First Baptist Church in New York that was in on Gold Street. And in 1808, four men and 11 women asked permission to leave First Baptist. And the image on the screen is the letter that was spoken into the record during a business meeting in 1809 at uh, First Baptist. And during Quentin's research, First Baptist still exists. They're now on 79th and Broadway. And Quentin reached out to them to see if they had any records from that time. And they did. They ha had minute books in this big safe, minute books going back to 1700s and the 1800s. And this book is, um, uh, this letter was there and it includes the names of the people which we had, we did not know before that time at Abyssinian. Uh, the departure, the letter doesn't say exactly why they're leaving, um, but it's a very strategic diplomatic letter. Um, and I'll just read maybe the last two paragraphs. Dear brethren, should you see cause to grant us our request, we shall still, still feel it our privilege to look up to you for instruction that through sovereign power and electing love, we may be found steadfast and immovable, all abounding in the work of the Lord. Though separated in places of worship, yet we trust not in the object of worship, and believing that the great head of the church will lead us to fountains of living water, and that God will ere long wipe away all tears from our eyes, and that we shall behold him, whom our souls love in unbeclouded day. May God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen and amen. Done by order and in behalf of the brethren and sisters of color belonging to the First Baptist Church in this city, together with a small number from other churches. And I'll talk about why that letter had to be so diplomatic as, as we move forward. 
when they left, um, about uh, two years later, they purchased a church from Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is a white congregation. It was at 40 or 44. Those different numbers have been used. Anthony Street, which is now Word Street. And so that was between church and West Broadway. And by 1813, they had 73 regular members. They had a series of pastors over the next decades. And usually those pastors served for two or three years. Um, they struggled, but they grew. Uh, by 1840, they had 259 members, but their financial struggles continued. And what's behind that is there were a lot of limitations on what Black people could do. New York was one of the largest slave states in the North, and it was tied to slavery. They eventually abolished slavery in 1827, but there were a lot of social restrictions that went with that. They limited Black people's access to certain jobs. And so most Black people were working very for very little money. Um, and that was reflected in their ability to support the church. Um, they struggled to pay their mortgage because they had taken out a mortgage to buy the church. And they struggled to support the pastor. And they often had to ask for help from the church they left, First Baptist. And so that's part of the reason for that diplomacy in their leaving. The other is that Baptist churches, New York was a relatively small city at that time, and there weren't that many churches. And there is a fellowship across race lines for churches if they were ordaining people, if there was a vacancy and they needed somebody to fill in as a supply preacher, they might need to call on those white congregations. And so that's what they did periodically in those first decades then. In 1841, they reach a level of stability when Reverend Sampson White is called to be the pastor. And he had a ministry that dated to Virginia in the years after Nat Turner's 1831 rebellion. He went on from there and founded 19th Street Baptist Church in Washington, DC. And he remained at Abyssinian for six years, provided some stability compared to the two or three years that other pastors had been there. But he left in 1847 to found Concord Baptist Church in Brooklyn. And this is at the time that New York City is Manhattan. Brooklyn is a separate city. There were Abyssinian members from Brooklyn who were traveling on Sunday to attend Abyssinian. And this is before the bridges were built. So they would have had to take a ferry and it was inconvenient. And eventually they petitioned Abyssinian to leave and form their own congregation. And uh, Samson White uh, became their initial pastor. And Abyssinian then called John T. Raymond as pastor. And um, it's not, our records don't make clear how long he was there. But what we do know is that um, in 1854, the Anthony Street building was sold. And this is an account in the New York Times. This is June 23rd, 1854. The Abyssinian church, unfortunately, has lost its edifice. A mortgage upon it was foreclosed, and the congregation now worship at 356 Broadway. Ten of the members, by their own request, have received a joint letter for the purpose of establishing another church of the same faith and order. The brethren have heaviness of heart in leaving these premises for which they say their fathers, mothers, and friends toiled long, yet the hand of the spoiler has gained the ascendancy. The, that article is not totally accurate. Um, the church was not foreclosed on. 
Um, it was sold though. And um, part of my research with Witness, because of my background with real estate, I've used real estate records in a lot of my research, particularly about Harlem. And looking at the real estate records, that really gave us a more accurate picture. And this is what those records say. Um, the meeting, and, the, and it's related to, these are in the sales documents at the New York City Register's office. The meeting house on said lots is built of wood, is quite old, and needs considerable, considerable repairs that many of the members of the church and congregation are now comparatively few in number, and that by reason thereof, they are less than able to support the burdens of the debt which has long embarrassed them that said property is now covered by mortgages to the amount of eight of about $8,600 and that arrears of interest are due thereon and that actions for the foreclosure of one of them is now pending in which the costs are largely accumulating and that by means thereof, their said property is likely to be sold at a forced sale or sacrifice. And that in view of said facts, it has been deemed most for the interests of the church that said property should be sold and debts of the church paid off with the proceeds and that the church should remove their place of meeting further uptown. And the building was sold for $12,200, which is over $250,000 in today's money. And 8,600 of that amount went to the mortgage holders and they had that balance that they placed in a fund. And so Abyssinian was without a building and they entered a phase that through oral history of the church becomes known as the Thompson Street migration. And it lasted um, for a little more than five years. They initially worshiped, worshiped at 356 Broadway and then at other uh locations in the Thompson Street and Spring Street area. And so this is in the village. Um, by that time, Black people have been moving from lower Manhattan, uh, both their institutions and where they lived, to the point that um, probably beginning in the 1820s or 1830s, the areas where they lived became nicknamed Little Africa. In the 1820s, there, there was a black theater company, the African Grove Theater, and that's named after Grove Street in the village. Um, Minette, Minetta Lane, in a lot of accounts, it's mentioned as a, a particular um, focal point. There's a stream, Minetta Stream, that goes through there, and that's a, the name of the, the lane takes after that. But it was said that the, the rents in those areas were much lower, so they were attractive. And so Abyssinian moves where Black people are living. In 1856, they call Reverend William Spellman as pastor. And he had been pastor of Third Stonington Baptist Church in Connecticut uh, for about five years. And so there's still renting spaces um, when he becomes pastor. Uh, to give us a sense of Manhattan at that time, because often accounts of, of the movement of Black people in Manhattan are not as nuanced as they could be, because it makes it seem like everybody moves to one place. But often what's happening is some people stay in the previous location, other people move. And this warp map will give us a good idea of what the distribution of Black population in Manhattan in 1850 looked like. This is a warp map from the mid 1800s. And, um, and this is, as you, you know, midtown to lower Manhattan, above that line uh, was all the 12th ward. If we look at population in Greenwich Village, so Greenwich Village is the ninth and 12th Ward, 15th Ward rather, um, the population in 1850 there is 
white population 40,000, black population 500 in Ward 9, white population in Ward 15, 21,000, black population 990. And so it is a, a assemblage of black people, but the numbers are not great. And during this period in the 1800s, the black population ranged from one to 3% of the total population of Manhattan at any time. When we uh, pull back and look at the ward, white, ward by ward numbers, um, black people are living in every ward of the city. And so the, I think what happens often is we look at the segregation, hardline segregation that we know is coming and we project it back. And so this distribution, there's a few places where there are large populations of Black people. Uh, the area between Canal and Reed Street, the area between Canal and Houston, you've got um, a, almost 2,500 Black people in each of those wards. The others range from 100 to you know, 500, which we saw in the village. And the same thing with the, and then the next uh, largest one is this area between Canal Houston and Broadway, um, but Black people are widely distributed. And that's not to say they're not limitations. And to kind of really figure out what is happening, we'd have to almost look block by block. But Abyssinian, in some ways, it's not just going to where the most Black people are. Most like there are social ties that are bringing them to those areas. There are other institutions that are moving there as well and other churches. Um, so Abyssinian's first church on Anthony Street, they were near other churches, St. Philip's, Mother Amy Zion, who were also in that church Leonard area. Um, and this is uh, just a general map of Greenwich Village to give us a kind of better sense of where they, so they are mainly moving around in this area during that time. In 1859, they decide to update their incorporation documents and they revised an 1813 document. Um, they, the new document called for nine trustees to manage the new corporation. And it has um, some puzzling, a puzzling feature in that there were five trustees that were elected by Abyssinian members and then there were four trustees that were elected by members of four white congregations. First Baptist Church, where they left, um, Tabernacle Baptist Church, Berean Baptist Church, and Stanton Street Baptist Church. And these congregations had periodically made loans to Abyssinian, and, and we don't have documentation of an agreement, but it does seem that they wanted to protect their investments by negotiating seats on the on the board of trustees. Um, a year after that incorporation document was uh, revised, Abyssinian found a new home and they began worshiping at 166 Waverly Place. Uh, it was formerly the place of worship of the third Reformed Presbyterian Church it was Waverly uh, off of Sixth Avenue. And uh, three years later, in June of 1863, they purchased Waverly Place for $4,000. And the image that was on the registration for this, and that's on the cover of Witness, is an image of this building, but it looks almost like a country church because they've airbrushed out these buildings that were on both sides of it. So it was a modest sized building between other buildings on that block. The, and this is a, a map just giving us this. And so Abyssinian is here. Across from there was uh, the Northern Dispensary, in which was a, a medical related building. They have company of other Black churches in this area. Um, Shiloh Presbyterian, a Black congregation uh, that 
uh, Henry Highland Garnett, pastor uh, from 1859 to 1863, was on Prince Street near Marion and St. Philip's Episcopal Church, which was founded a year after the Abyssinian in 1809, moved to Mulberry Street in 1857. And this image is the uh, St. Philip's uh, Church on Mulberry Street. About three weeks after Abyssinian purchases um, the Waverly Place building, the area is hit by the New York City draft riots. Um, the Civil War had begun in April of 1861. And during the first two years, the Union was really struggling with a lot of losses. The, the Confederate Army had most of the top people who graduated at the top of their class in West Point were with the Confederate Army. And often people were deserting. Um, there were farm boys who had never been away and they would just leave. And so the Congress decided and the president decided, Lincoln decided to institute the first draft. And it had a provision that uh, became problematic. Um, the if someone was drafted they could pay to have a substitute uh go in their place they could pay three hundred dollars to have a substitute go in their place and three hundred dollars was about the wages annual wages of a person so it was only wealthy people who were going to be able to afford to do that and that saying it's a rich man's war and a poor man's fight is you know kind of depicts that situation when the draft, uh, the day that the draft was to begin in New York, and it was uh, the draft location was on the east side, um, uh, I believe it's in the 30s. Um, that morning, uh, a crowd gathers along where Central Park is under construction. They make their way to the draft office and they basically tear it up. And then they go from there to move around the city and they're targeting black people, black institutions, white people allied. They're moving around. They burn the colored orphan uh, asylum, which was at Fifth Avenue and 41st Street. And there are about a hundred children that the matrons there are able to get out the back door while the rioters are coming in on the front. Um, they chase people down on the street and kill them. Uh, it and this is going on for about three days, and it only ends when the Union troops are called from the Gettysburg battlefield that just had ended um, to come to New York to restore order. Um, churches were affected by this, and there are accounts in the newspapers of of that time that uh, talk about it. Um, in the early first week of August, there was a, a black newspaper called the Anglo-African. And this is what they say. Several of the window glasses of Shiloh Church have been broken by rioters, but the interior has not been injured. St. Philip's Church has been used as quarters by soldiers ever since the riot, the basement being used by a number of our people as a place of refuge. The Abyssinian Baptist Church is now closed, and the pastor of it, William Spellman, with his family, is in Connecticut. The Zion Baptist Church is also closed, and its pastor, Reverend John T. Raymond, with his family, is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In Zion Church, services are had through the day, but in the evening, it is closed. Reverend Samson Talbot is at home in Troy. All of the small churches are closed and are likely to remain so for some time. An immense number of colored families have left the city with the view of never returning. Uh, the draft riots had a devastating effect on the black community. The population, black population in Manhattan before the draft riots was around 12,000. And in the, uh, the New York state did a uh, census every five, on the five years. So it kind of was in between the federal census. So the 1865 census 
the black population is is nine thousand, so it had gone down by about three thousand. Some of those people moved to Brooklyn. Brooklyn was seen as some of them fled there during the riots, and some moved there later. Some moved to other places as well. Um, church leaders, particularly Henry Harlan Garnett of uh, um, Shiloh Presbyterian and Charles uh, Ray of Bethesda Methodists, were asked to really uh, determine the the needs of the black community. And there was a merchants organization that raised money to uh, provide uh, for um, people's losses. And um, Abyssinian um, did reopen. It wasn't damaged uh, like St. Philip's where troops had been quartered and St. Philip's filed a grievance um, and they got partial reparations for that. Uh, but the draft riots uh, become a marker for kind of a feeling that they're really black people are not safe in New York. Um, but churches are still moving to the village. Um, in 1864, uh, AM, the AME Zion Church um, moved to Bleecker Street at 10th Street. And uh, it was the oldest black church in New York City, founded in 1796. And then in 1820, it becomes the mother church of the AME Zion denomination. And, um, and so now it's known as Mother AME Zion. And so they moved to Bleecker Street. Um, Abyssinian at Waverly Place is when Abyssinian moves past its struggles and begins to grow. And some of that also, I believe, has to do with the fact that they had stable leadership. Um, uh, Samson White uh, was able to provide some of that um, for a few years. And um, William Spellman um, was there for decades. And so they were able to have stable leadership and grow. And this is a um, just a notice from the New York Times in October of 1866. Um, about a mass meeting. A mass meeting of the colored citizens of this city will be held on Monday evening at the Abyssinian Baptist Church, Waverly Place near Sixth Avenue for the purpose of electing delegates to the state convention at Albany on the 10th of October. The meeting will be addressed by Professor William Howard Day and others. Black people begin holding annual conventions in the 1830s. And I don't know the details of this state conven convention, but they become important places of what we will call networking today, um, developing common grievances, plans for action. And so the fact that this is being held at Abyssinian, I think gives us a sign that, um, that they're seen as um, an important uh, institution in the Black community. The Times uh, in 1871, uh, they printed an article looking at the value of Black church property. And I'm not sure what the impetus for this was, but it, from a research point of view, has really interesting information. Part of that impetus now, you know, as I'm thinking through it might be, so this is, during the Reconstruction era. It's in the middle of Reconstruction. The question mark about, well, what will Black people do in freedom? Although that's often posed in the South, Northerners had their doubts about Black people being able to manage their own affairs. And, you know, kind of if we think about that Abyssinian incorporation with four white trustees, that's, I think that comes from part of that belief. Um, and in this article, they uh, give an assessment of the value of property owned by uh, the seven Black churches in, in Manhattan. In St. Phillips, uh, where Reverend John Peterson was pastor, they had property valued at $75,000. <clears> Shiloh Presbyterian with Henry Highland Garnett as pastor had property valued at $60,000. Bethel Methodist. Uh, Reverend N.H. Turpin was the pastor. 
They have property valued at 80,000. Zion Methodist Episcopal Church, um, that's AME Zion, uh, with WF Butler as pastor, they had property valued at 200,000. And in Abyssinian uh, with Reverend William Spellman has property at 65,000. And, uh, and so when we think about where they were 20 years before, uh, out of rented space, um, you know, kind of in that migration period, um, this is definitely a sign of progress. Then Youth Union Methodists had, uh, with William Howard as pastor, property of 50,000, and Bethesda Methodists with Charles Ray, $40,000 uh, of property. Uh, 10 years later, uh, the Times has an article, they're looking citywide at black and white churches, and they're looking at membership of the church. And this gives us a sense of the growth in Abyssinians membership. Um, and uh, among these, they are, uh, they are six uh, with a membership of 1,435. And the largest was Fifth Avenue Presbyterian of 1,730. Uh, Broadway Tabernacle had one th a little more than 1,000 or almost 1,100. Um, and so they've grown a lot uh, in those years then. And what's behind that growth is population growth of the Black community in uh, Manhattan. New York City is still just Manhattan um, during this period. And so if we look at this, in 1865, Black population was 10,000. Um, in 1870, 13, 1880, it's uh, a little more than 19. Total population of New York is growing as well. And so it grows from 700, about 725,000 to over 1.1 million. And so the percentage of Black people in New York doesn't really change because the overall population is growing at pretty much the same rate. The, in, 1884, January of 1884, uh, William Spellman celebrates his 29th anniversary. And I'm going to read a passage from Witness, just talking about that a little bit. January 13th, 1884, could not have been a better Sunday for Pastor William Spellman and members of the Abyssinian Baptist Church. 50 men from the St. John's Commandery number four colored knights of Pythias were present in full regalia, signifying this celebratory service as a special occasion. And there was much about which to be happy. Reverend Robert D. Wynn, a former member of Abyssinian and pastor of Mount Calvary Church in Norwich, Connecticut, had come home and was on the rostrum to help celebrate Spellman's 29th anniversary as pastor of Abyssinian. Things were very good for the congregation. Under Spellman, the church had flourished. Membership was high and all debts had been retired. In 1880, there were 872 Baptist churches in the state of New York, and Abyssinian was one of only four with the membership exceeding 800. In fact, with 1,400 members, it was the largest Baptist church in the state. As Pastor Spellman gazed out over his flock, his eyes sparkling with pride, there was no reason for him to think the good times at the church would not last. However, events conspired to change the course of Abyssinian history, forcing the congregation to part ways with its beloved pastor. And the roots of that dissension or division was precipitated by the death of the longtime treasurer, who was a confectioner and a caterer, Jacob Day. Um, and uh, Village Preservation has written about his house at 50 West 13th Street, um, advocating for it to get landmark status. Um, he had been pastor for a long time. And when he died, uh, Reverend Spellman was appointed as treasurer. Um, and that 
you know, just kind of from a financial management point of view, that's kind of strange um, for a pastor to also be treasurer. And um, people had complained about it, but they could not, they, they couldn't even get him to show them the financial records. And in September of 1884, a deacon, Henry Harris, within the Baptist church, its deacons are in charge of the spiritual life of the church. And technically, the pastor reports to the deacons. The trustees are in charge of the fiscal management. Uh, Deacon Harris, the Sunday before, had announced a special meeting. And the bylaws called that to have a special meeting, you had to make an announcement at two consecutive Sundays. And Reverend Spellman had tried, I think, believe had told him not to say anything. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, Deacon Harris uh, began to make this announcement and he was able to finish it before he could be stopped. Uh, Reverend Spellman had invited policemen to be present and he had uh, Deacon Harris arrested. And so that begins a period of, of turmoil. And eventually uh, that ends up in the courts with the courts as well as the, the Southern, the Baptist Association for New York trying to resolve this. Um, uh, Spellman in this eventually he is asked to resign and um, he refused and uh, he organized another congregation under the name of Abyssinian. And that congregation eventually changed its name to Antioch Baptist Church. And this is going on for uh, two years or so. And, uh, and it's in the newspapers quite a bit. In the middle of this, uh, Abyssinian calls a new pastor, and that was Reverend Robert Wynn. And he was the person who had been on the rostrum uh, for the, excuse me, had been on the rostrum for the 29th anniversary uh, program for Reverend uh, Spellman. Uh, he was a former member of Abyssinian. He had been pastor at Mount Calvary Church in Norwich, Connecticut. Um, by the time he comes in 1885, Black churches in New York are beginning to move from the village toward uh, the Midtown districts that are Black and Irish to some extent in the Tenderloin and in the San Juan Hill district. The Tenderloin roughly boundaries used are about 23rd Street up to um, the lower 50s. And then above that up to the low 60s was what became known as San Juan Hill. And this is between 6th and 8th Avenue. And then in the lower part of that, west of 8th Avenue is what was known as Hell's Kitchen, still is known as Hell's Kitchen. And by this time, there's still Irish there, but there are other immigrants as well. Um, and so that's the context that uh, Reverend Wynn uh, sees when he arrives. And he, because the debt has been extinguished, he uh, has them uh, begin uh, putting together a building fund. Um, and one thing I forgot um, is that in that in that uh, conflict with William Spellman, Abyssinian uh, revises his incorporation papers and rem they no longer have those outside trustees under this new uh, incorporation. So it's their organization. And that's the organization that Reverend Wynn uh, begins to lead. Abyssinian uh, continues to be in the papers. Um, sometimes the tone of the coverage is um, almost with a hint of ridicule. Um, and this is an article about a concert um, and the 
a colored folks concert and then the subtitle, the dusky fashionables of the city in silks and diamonds attended. In Steinway Hall last night, a concert was given for the benefit of the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Waverly Place, of which Reverend Robert Wynn is pastor. There were 2,000 people in the hall. Um, the article, it's a long article, it goes on to talk about what people were wearing. And, and it's, not, it's not overtly ridiculing them, but just the, the tone of it gives a sense almost like who do they think they are um abyssinian becomes a center for uh, political organizing and this is um much later in 1896 uh this is a mass meeting of colored republicans there will be a mass meeting of colored republicans tonight at the abyssinian baptist church 166 waverly place Bishop Derrick will be present and the speakers will include the Reverend Ernest Lyon, the Honorable John Murray Mitchell, candidate for Congress, T.T.B. Reed, M.D., Richard Van Cott, candidate for Assembly, W.R. Davis, LLB, and Pierre Bargue. The Reverend R.D. Wynn will preside. Um, and at this point, Tammany Hall is the Democratic Party and uh, Black New Yorkers. There are some who are linked to it, but many are not as Black people in other parts of the country in the 1890s are voting Republican, seeing it as the party of anti-slavery, the party of Lincoln. Um, in this next article, two years later, um, talks about the Black community's complaints about the Tammany Hall and their dismissiveness regarding the black vote. And, um, and in response to that, uh, black pastors organize. And so there's a, a very overt involvement in um, electoral politics during this time. Um, Robert Wynn, Robert Wynn had a vision for where Abyssinia should be going and he shared that and i'm just going to read a little bit from uh from witness again um at the beginning of the 20th century it was estimated that abyssinian had 1000 members reverend robert and we know they had more than that reverend robert Wynn regularly preached to full houses in waverly place members worshiped together expressed their faith through christian service supported missions and maintained their church. Abyssinian was in sound financial condition and the congregation had a building fund of $16,000. During 1900 and 1901, members of Abyssinian expected to hear Reverend Wynn again address the subject of moving uptown. And they're thinking maybe 53rd Street, which is an area that was becoming a center of black institutions. What they did not expect was his disclosure of the revelation of a new vision in 1901. Before the close of the year, Reverend Wynn, as the pastor and spiritual leader of the Congregation of Abyssinian, declared that he insisted flesh and blood had not revealed. God is calling us to move to Harlem. Abyssinian Baptist Church is to take its witness beyond the Tenderloin and San Juan Hill all the way to Harlem. Abyssinian and in 1901, there was a small Black enclave in Harlem. Um, if, if you know where Harlem Hospital is just south of that, the blocks of 135th, 134th, 133rd between Lenox and, and Fifth Avenues, um, they, were not per, they were not all Black, but substantially Black, those blocks. Other than that, there were very few Black people who lived in Harlem. And so... The congregation, when Reverend Wynn says this, they they resist, and um, he believes that it's a calling from God, and that they're being disobedient. And when they don't change their minds, he resigns, and they're surprised by that. Um, but they uh, then gather their senses, and they call Charles Satchel Morris 
as pastor in 1902. And he had a uh, interesting background. He was a uh, graduate of Newton, Massachusetts Theological Seminary. He has studied law in Michigan, worked for the IRS, and then on Ellis Island. He had been secretary to Frederick Douglass, and his first wife, uh, Anna, was Douglass's granddaughter. Um, he had witnessed the 1898 Wilmington, North Carolina massacre. Uh, he had traveled as a missionary to Africa, and he brought all of that breadth of experience to Abyssinia. And in this picture, he's shown with his wife, Sadie Waterman Morris, and, and their child. And this is probably around the time that he's coming to Abyssinia. And at Abyssinia, at Abyssinia, he preaches the uh, what became known as the social gospel, which was a, a belief within some Protestant and Catholic churches that churches should not just focus on building beautiful buildings, but they should look at the community around them and contribute to, contribute to the community. Morris, because he had traveled internationally, expanded that to advocate that Abyssinian members uh, work not only to improve the community around them, but uh, the world. And the during his time at Abyssinian, they do move, um, and uh, they don't move to Harlem. They move to 40th Street, and this is a picture of of the building there. Um, and this article um, uh, talks about that. Um, they initially they rent out the Waverly Place Church, and then in 1907. They sell the Waverly Place Church, and that allows them to buy an apartment building on the same block where the church is in 1907. And, um, and in part, we, like I can mention, we do not have many records from the 1800s, but I suspect that their interest in having that church or that apartment building was both for income but most likely also to have a resource to provide housing, which was at a, a premium by this time. Um, at the beginning of 1908, Reverend Morris began experiencing health issues uh, for which he was hospitalized. And it was rumored that he had um, a nervous breakdown connected to, uh, they called it a fever, and it seems like it was probably malaria um, returning. Um, and so he was hospitalized early in the year, and in April, um, he's still recuperating, and by that time, the officers were not confident that he was going to be able to serve, and so they requested his resignation, and he probably understanding the conflict that uh, happened with Reverend Spellman did not challenge that, and, and so he submitted his resignation. The church then called Reverend Adam Clayton Powell Sr., um, who had been pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in New Haven. And, um, and so Adam Clayton Powell Sr. became uh, the pastor of Abyssinian. And in some ways, when we look at Abyssinian's history, uh, the arrival of, of Adam Clayton Powell Sr. in 1908 is almost, you could say it's the beginning of the modern Abyssinian. Um, the uh, Powell Sr. Uh, was relatively well-educated. He uh, also was an advocate of the social gospel ministry. And um, when he arrives at Abyssinian, uh, he, he has a uh, so autobiography called Upon This Rock. And it's really kind of a church history and his own personal history, where he talks about his initial arrival on 40th Street and how he uh, worked to clean up the block and do different things. Um, but he's also thinking about, is 40th Street going to be the future for Black people? And like Reverend Wynn, uh, he sees Harlem as that future. And in um, 1920, he convinces the church to buy property on 138th Street between Lenox and 7th Avenue. Uh, the first uh, year or so, they put a tent up there in the summer of 
and they have services up there so people can get used to going up there. Uh, by this time, the subway has been built. And then in 1923, they complete the building on the left. And he has a sermon where he talks about the model church. This um, part of the church on the left is um, a community house. And that was a part of many churches that followed the social gospel, or sometimes they called them institutional churches. And that community house, the lower level, had a fellowship hall for meals, but also it could be converted into a basketball court. The roof of this building um, had a playground for children. These floors had um, uh, classrooms uh, for people who, by this time, it's the Great Migration. People are moving from the South. And then uh, the rest of the building is the sanctuary. And this is a contemporary picture of, of the sanctuary now. And so Abyssinian, um, although it's very much associated with Harlem now, uh, it was in the village for over 50 years. And those are very important years because it's only that stability there that really, really provides the foundation for what Abyssinian was able to move forward and do. And so I'll stop there. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. This was so fascinating. And we already have so many questions to ask you. So um, let's get started. There was a question toward the beginning when um, you were talking about the location in the village of the church, um, whether that was before the Great Migration and were, was the constituency um, African Black Africans? Was it African Americans? What, what was kind of the makeup when it first started in the church? It, or in uh, the it, the the in the village or when it first started in 1808 uh i think it was in the village that was the time it was 6 22 p.m but i don't i don't expect okay. you to remember okay yeah so, yeah so they first they're in rented spaces in the village in 1854 between 1854 and 1860 when they then uh moved to the waverly place the the black population of New York is mainly uh, native born black people. Um, you know, by this time slavery has been abolished, but there are people who, the first black people come to New York in about 1621, I believe it is. And many of them became free. And so it's unfortunate that we can't trace our ancestry, but if we could, some of those people might have traced your ancestry to that period. Um, others may have been people from the South, um, free or people seeking their freedom. Uh, the Fugitive Slave Act is passed in 1850, and that makes Black people uncomfortable, whether they're free or enslaved in the North, because slave catchers are coming up and churches become important refuges for that. Um, to my knowledge, I don't think uh, either uh, continental Africans or people from the Caribbean are a substantial population during this time. It's it's uh, mainly native born people born in the United States that that are in in the village during this period. That's great, thank you. And then someone asked, um, they believe there's a 12th Ward school building still in existence, um, possibly on Mott Street street between spring and houston do you have any knowledge of that if not that's we can I, move on um let's see i don't but a friend of mine eric washington is um i'm part of a committee working on a a building uh that the city owns and it was a form of school building um and but i don't i can't remember i don't think it's that address so that might be another building Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's part of what we're, we're looking to find out in all of this mm -hmm. research that everyone's doing. And then um, they, the person says they may have missed it, but where does the name come from for the church? Part of the reason why I spent a little bit of time reading that letter, the founding letter is because it clarified a founding story that I believe 
um, developed sometime in the 20th century that the name, so Abyssinia is a ancient name for Ethiopia. I'm, I don't know that Ethiopians <laughs> use that name, but Europeans do. And so now when we think of it, we think of just that country, but in 1808, people often used Ethiopia to talk about black people in general, the continent in general. Um, and so the founding story that I believe developed in the 20th century was that the founders were Ethiopian sailors. And when I joined Abyssinia in, in 1987, that's what was, we were, as we did tours um, with the Archives and History Ministry, that's what we would say. But Houston, um, uh, Clinton Dixie, when he was doing the research on that early period, he looked at all the shipping records. So every time a ship came into town in the early 1800s, it was in the paper, no Ethiopian ships. He looked at presence of Ethiopian and they were not there. And that's why he went to First Baptist because he was thinking, okay, if they left, um, and he has a background in religious uh, history. So when you leave a church and you want to go to another, you need to leave in what they call good standing. And if you don't, then you might not be able to be accepted as a member. And so they wanted to leave in good standing. And so all of that, so that letter, that's what it's about, but it's also clarifying. So with that understanding, I believe it was them, this is 1808, and they are making a conscious link with the continent of Africa. And so there are many, so the African Society for Mutual Relief gets started in New York about that same year. And other organizations are using Africa in their name during that time. And so I think this congregation used Abyssinian um, rather than Africa in their name uh, is where that, I believe that's what, why it's there. Yeah, that's so fascinating. It's, it's just so much work to get this research done. It's so fascinating to think going through all the records of every ship that came in in a certain period is, is a, a huge task. So that's fascinating. And then we have one more question, unless anyone else has any final questions. Was Seneca Village, um, a part of the black population numbers you shared and how does the population from Seneca village kind of play a role? I know that's outside the village, but. Um, yeah, so there, it would have been in that 12th ward um, that wasn't on the map um, that I showed. Um, Seneca village gets um, established in the 1820s and it's along what's now Central Park West roughly in the 80s, probably 82nd to 85th going into the park. And it has a substantial black population. Uh, the AME Zion church has a um, kind of a missionary church there. There's two schools, there's another church. It's probably one third black, white people are also there. It's very important because in 1820, when New York State revises this constitution, they do away with property requirements to vote for white men. So white men can vote regardless. Before, property requirements was the only barrier to voting. And so Black people who owned a certain amount of property could vote. That change they keep the property requirement for black men and the, the amount was $250 worth of property. And that, you know, that's probably, I don't know, maybe $50,000, something like that. But it was a lot more, if you think about the Abyssinian members that we're talking about, um, they're not able to get that. Seneca Village, provides opportunities for black people to own land. And so when you look at black, who's voting in let's say 1850, the majority of them are Seneca Village residents and it's not a lot, it's less than two dozen, I believe statewide. 
Um, at about the same time, Weeksville is getting established in Brooklyn, another black community. And um, and it would have that same impact. I haven't researched that, but it was a statewide law. So if you own land in Weeksville, and so that land, that opportunity to own land in these settlements become very important. Weeksville, I believe, was all black. Seneca Village was about a third black and um and white people were there too. When the plan to build Central Park is created, and it was created as a amenity to increase property values of what became Millionaire's Row on Fifth Avenue. Um, it's kind of an early urban renewal situation with some of the same things. They they declared Seneca Village blighted and their articles when they say, oh, there's nobody in Seneca Village but goats and shanties. And, you know, you got two churches, schools. It was a settlement, but they wanted that land. And so they they were able to get it through, what, from what I understand, an eminent domain. And I believe people got some compensation, but typically people don't get what it's really worth. And um, and so it's an opportunity that's lost then. Yes, it's a tale as old as time, I feel like. Um, but we, we have a lot of, um, and also from the real estate perspective, that's super interesting. And then someone, the last question we have is, uh, does Philip Payne have, or Payton, sorry, Philip Payton have anything to do with the purchase of the Abyssinian church? Not that I know of, and I've, I've studied him a lot. Um, so when they moved to Harlem, um, actually, um, he couldn't because he died in 1917, and they buy property in Harlem in 1920. But Charles Satchel Morris does play a role. Um, so if you remember, they don't want to move to Harlem, and that's why Reverend Wynn left. Charles, they called Charles Satchel Morris to succeed him. Charles Satchel Morris bought property in Harlem in 1903. Um, he's at Abyssinian. By that time, they're on 40th Street. But he has that vision. And when Philip Payton begins buying property in that enclave that I mentioned, 133rd, 134th, uh, 135th, uh, Morris's property, I can't remember the exact address, but it's right in that area. And he transfers that property. He bought it in his name. He transfers it to Abyssinian's name. Um, when Adam Clayton Powell Sr. becomes pastor, he buys a brownstone in Harlem. Um, and he becomes pastor in 1908. I can't remember the exact year. But both of them are, you know, kind of, the, you can see them saying, I'm going to pull these people along to Harlem. And he was very much known for Adam Clayton Paul Sr. for promoting Black people owning property in Harlem. Um, he, he becomes a very important figure. And then, it, of course, his son, Adam Clayton Paul Jr. as well. And 